Hello, and welcome to Crime Bites, the show where we talk about some truly bizarre and disturbing crime cases. My name is Liz, and today is True Crime Tuesday. So last Sunday was Easter, and I made sure to keep my little, uh, my peep headband. Yes, I'm still a bit obsessed. Anyhow, I wasn't sure what type of case to pick for today's episode, so I did a quick little Google of true crime and Easter, and I stumbled upon a fun fact. So apparently in Norway, true crime is all the rage for Easter, so much so that they have a term for it, Paskerkim. Now, for all the Norwegian words that I will attempt to pronounce, I will apologize now because there's a couple. Anyhow, most TV and radio stations will produce special true crime episodes just for Easter. Apparently, the Norwegians feel that true crime and Easter just go together. And I guess if you kind of delve into the real story of Easter, it kind of makes sense. So Norway itself has an extremely low crime rate, one of the lowest in the world. But I did find a story for us today that is pretty terrible and it took place in Norway in 2011. So let's start by meeting 21-year-old Adrian Prakken. He is attending a summer camp for young members of Norway's AUF, or the Labor Party Youth League. The camp is set on a beautiful island named Utøya, set on the glacial length of Trifjorden just 25 miles west of Oslo. It's July 22nd of 2011, and that morning, Gro Brundtland, Norway's first female prime minister, was coming to visit and was scheduled to have dinner there. It's a slightly rainy day, and the prime minister decides to cut her visit to the island short, and she leaves after having lunch with her granddaughter. After the prime minister left, Adrian and the others who were in the office were chatting about her visit and eating some sandwiches when another one of the camp's leaders bursts into the room and exclaims that there had been an explosion in Oslo. It took them around five minutes to get the news going and when they did, they could not believe what they were seeing. At 3.26 p.m., a white van had been parked outside of Oslo's governmental tower buildings. The van was packed with almost a ton of fertilizer-based explosives and was detonated, killing eight people and injuring over 200. One woman had part of a window blast off and impale her between her skin and skull, but miraculously, she survived. Blood was everywhere, and it's said that hundreds of pieces from the dead were found all over the streets and rooftops. Everyone was simply horrified that this was actually happening. The camp leaders decided to hold a safety meeting and cancel that night's disco event that they had planned, but they weren't particularly concerned as they considered the island to be one of the safest places in Norway. So they hold the meeting at 4.30. They go and they gather all the kids to the cafeteria where they explained what had happened in Oslo and why the evening's festivities would be canceled. Otherwise, they would set up screens to watch whenever the prime minister would ultimately make some sort of address to the nation about what had happened. Meanwhile, a man boards the ferry to Utøya, showing a police ID and stating that he was being sent to make sure that the island is secure. He is met by the camp's director and their security guard, who is an off-duty policeman. Upon initial questioning, the director and security guard are a bit confused because, for one, no one from the police had contacted them about this, but he suggests that they head up to the main building so that he can explain further. As soon as they turn to start walking in that direction, the man raises a pistol and shoots them both in the head. Adrian hears the bangs from gunfire and thinks it's a hammer or something like that. Then there come another series of bangs. Adrian is slightly puzzled at this point, but is soon bewildered again as people come rushing towards him. He sees one of his friends who yells out to him to run, and when he asks why, she responds with, he's shooting. 
The man was headed towards the small assembly hall, shooting everyone that he could along the way. At one point, Adrian describes kind of watching him, still not sure if this was really happening or if it was some sort of drill, when a woman came from the shower area and walked straight up to him. As soon as she was about a meter away, he raised his pistol and shot her three times in the torso. As this was happening, everyone around Adrian took off running again and he joined them. They ran past the cafe and towards the water. The group that he was with made it to the southernmost tip of Utoya, and a bunch of them started to attempt to swim away from the island. Adrian wraps his phone and his wallet and leaves them on the shore. Then he heads into the water fully clothed. His boots start to weigh him down, and at about 50 meters out, he wondered if he was making a mistake by trying to swim to freedom, and ends up turning back. Right as he is sure he will die by drowning, his feet hit the bottom, and he stops to breathe. Then he started making his way back to shore slowly. Right when he reached waist level water, the man in the police uniform came out from behind the bushes. He started shooting at the people swimming away, screaming that he was going to kill them and that they were all going to die. Then he turned his gaze and locks eyes with Adrian. Adrian was too tired to even raise his arms at this point and simply stands there and yells, no, don't shoot, and then holds his breath. The guy raises his gun and stares at him, but then lowers it, turns, and walks in the opposite direction. Adrian took the remaining steps back to land and collapsed on a rock. He would hear a few gunshots after. The man, whose name was Anders Breverick, would surrender on site to the Oslo Police Tactical Unit that responded without any resistance. When he was detained, he said that the purpose of his attack was to save Norway and Western Europe from a Muslim takeover, and specifically that the Norwegian Labour Party had to pay the price for letting down Norway and the Norwegian people. Breviak would claim that he started coming up with this attack plan in 2002, which was nine years before the attacks actually happened. So, who was this Anders Breviak? Breviak was born in Oslo, but lived in London with his parents because his father did diplomatic work for the Norwegian embassy there. When his parents divorced, he was only one and moved back to Oslo with his mother. His mother was a nursing assistant who had borderline personality disorder. From the time she was pregnant with him, she thought that he was a nasty child and that he would even kick her on purpose while he was still in the womb. She even went as far as trying to abort him, but was past the three-month threshold that London had at that time for abortions. She stopped breastfeeding him early, claiming that he was sucking the life out of her. When he was just two, she would apply for respite care for him, claiming that he was clingy and demanding. Then she sought help from a child psychiatry place where they stayed as outpatients for about a month. The psychiatrist observing them concluded that Breviak should be placed in foster care as his mother was preventing him from developing normally. Staff would even state that his mother told him she wished he was dead while she was under observation. She also would state that he was a dirty child. However, he was actually clean to the point of obsessiveness. He showed signs of anxiety and would alternate between clinginess and petty aggression with his mother. He also had a very unnatural smile, if that makes any sense. Like he was smiling because he knew he was supposed to be and not because he was actually happy. So in spite of the recommendation to place Breviak in foster care, Child Welfare Services um, 
instead just sent him away to respite care during the weekends. When his father learned what was happening, he filed for custody. And when this happened, his mother went and demanded full custody and the case ended up being dropped because the welfare services didn't think that they could provide enough evidence to support their claim that little Anders should be in foster care. After this, the family was supervised, but this was discontinued after only three visits. Anders did okay in junior high, but when he was a teen, he got into steroids, hip hop, and graffiti. Um, he was described as a prolific graffiti artist, but after being caught and fined a couple different times, his dad went as far as to cut off contact with him. Apparently, he was deemed unfit for service by the Norwegian army, so he found a job when he was 21 for a customer service department where people generally liked him, but there were a few of his coworkers who felt that he was a tad egotistical. When he was 23, he started planning this attack. Around this time, he started his own business. It was a computer programming business and he did fairly well for himself. He made his first million kroner, which is the Norwegian currency, and he would say that he lost about two million overall in the stock market and about two million was what he spent financing his attack. Unfortunately, the success would not last and his company would end up filing for bankruptcy, causing him to move back in with his mother to save money. Then he started a farming company in 2009, which he basically used as a cover to obtain large amounts of fertilizer and some of the other chemicals that he used to make his explosives that he used in the attack on Oslo. So Andreas Breviak was charged with destabilizing or destroying basic functions of society and creating serious fear in the population, which are both considered acts of terrorism. He was indicted in March of 2012. He was then evaluated by a psychologist and diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and it was determined that he was psychotic when he carried out the attacks. A second evaluation was ordered after many people weren't quite satisfied with this first result, and the results of this one were that he was not psychotic when he carried out the attacks, which I think is apparent by the fact that he spent nine years planning them. They diagnosed him instead with antisocial personality disorder along with narcissistic personality disorder, which seems way more accurate. He ended up receiving the highest possible sentence in Norway's court systems, which is 21 years of prison. In spite of this, the court is able to prolong the sentence after its conclusion at increments of five years, as long as whatever presiding authorities deem it necessary. So there's that. So as we mentioned before, when he was arrested, he stated the purpose of his attack was to save Norway and Western Europe from a Muslim takeover. <clears throat> so about an hour before the attack, he sent out a bunch of emails with a 1,500 page manifesto detailing attacks that would take place in the future. He had copied a bunch of things to this manifesto, but also detailed his planning process. He was described as a neo-Nazi and far-right extremist. There are a couple key points that make this attack different from normal mass shootings or attacks. For one, in many of these attacks, it's basically a suicide mission, and in this case, Andrew was not looking to be killed, he was looking to become a hero. He targeted a specific people group, which does happen in some mass attacks. Well, in others, they just focus more on mass carnage. Andre was looking to take out people specifically from his country's Labor Party. Finally, we're going to talk about why Andre didn't shoot Adrian while he was standing in the water. He stated, this person appeared right wing. That was his appearance. That's the reason I didn't fire any shots at him. When I looked at him, I saw myself. Adrian was glad to know why, but he still would deal with some survivor's guilt because he lost so many of his friends in this attack. 
And that is going to do it. But as always, let's try to end today on a positive note. So as I mentioned before, Norway is a country with one of the world's lowest homicide rates. So they've got to be doing something right. Right? Um, there are a few reasons that this might be. One explanation that I found is that they have very strict gun control laws. Even hunting rifles are restricted over there. Guns are also required to be carefully locked away when they're not in use. Another factor that Norway credits its low crime rate to is the low poverty rate, which makes perfect sense. If you're not in poverty, you might be less likely to commit crimes. They have a fairly strong social welfare system over there, as well as a high level of trust in their judicial system. They place an emphasis on reintegrating people who do commit crimes back into society, offering them resources to get back on track so that they will be less likely to reoffend. It seems that we could possibly learn a few things from Norway. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic start to your April. It looks like we might finally be getting some good weather over here. So try and make the most of it, but try and stay safe out there as well. Bye! Mm -hmm.